All right, well, uh, welcome everyone um, uh, to uh, today's CITP seminar. I'm delighted to welcome our very good friend, Ryan Kahlo, uh, virtually, unfortunately, but hopefully in the not too distant future in person. Um, uh, Ryan is the Lane Powell and D. Wayne Gittinger Professor of Law at the University of Washington. He is a leading legal scholar on pretty much any place the law deals with technology. Um, uh, in particular, he's done seminal work on consumer privacy, um, market manipulation, you know, back before it was like dark patterns, right? He, he was there before it was cool. Um, uh, artificial intelligence policy, um, you know, a wide range of subjects. In addition to his academic scholarship, he's been incredibly influential in engaging with uh, legislators and regulators on a wide range of topics. Um, uh, I learn a lot every time I talk to Ryan, and I hope uh, you will too. Um, our format today is going to be uh, clarifying questions during Ryan's presentation, then uh, a fulsome Q&A afterward. Um, uh, this presentation is going to have a, uh, a legal workshop model, which is a little bit different from what we sometimes do, uh, a little bit shorter uh, on the presentation side and a little longer on the discussion side at the end. So there'll be plenty of time for Q&A. Um, I've blathered on enough, so let me stop now and hand it over to Ryan. Welcome. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Um... It's uh, it's great to see you. I wish it I wish it were in person, like the like when you came to 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 visit um, prior to the pandemic. But next time for sure. Um, hello everybody. Great to great to be with you. Um, thanks to the CITP. Um, I absolutely love speaking here. Um, I think the last time was years ago about augmented and uh, virtual reality, right? Which um, you know. Uh, I, I suppose is coming back around, <laughs> as as it were. Um, I'm, I'm especially loving all of the references to. Um, is this the same metaverse as Second Life, or is this a different uh, <laughs> a different metaverse? Um, but anyway, this is a project that's about the government's use of um, computational modeling, um, and the modeling through of the title is a pun. A, a variation, I suppose, on a famous, famous, in political science circles, a famous um, a piece by Charles Lindblom called The Science uh, of Muddling Through, um, which, I'll, which I'll refer to a little bit later. Um, and the, the paper grows out of um, my, my immediately prior article with uh, Danielle Citrin, who's known to almost all of you because she's just the leading light in our field. Um, she's over at UVA Law. Um, and that was a rather somewhat pessimistic look at the use of um, algorithms and automation by the administrative state, by, by federal and state um, agencies. And it was um, uh, called the administrative, uh, automated administrative state, a crisis in legitimacy. And the argument there was that the reason constitutionally in the United States that it's okay to take all of this power that's supposed to reside in um, the, legislation, the legislature and commit that power to these big bureaucracies, these agencies. The reason that's supposed to be legitimate is because these agencies like the Food and Drug Administration, like the EPA, like the Federal Trade Commission, you name it, um, they're, they're repositories of expertise and they can be more nimble and exercise their discretion. Um, and so the world being so complicated and um, fast moving, we can't expect Congress or state legislature to really keep up. And so they're allowed to create these, these golems. They, they're, they're allowed to create these um, uh, giant robots as one of my students put it uh, in order to do their bidding. And the whole thing is premised on the idea that they're expert um, and, they're, and they have discretion. Um, but these same agencies ha have become a worrisome trend of throwing away that expertise and that discretion with both hands by recommitting the power, the responsibility given to them uh, by a legislative body to automation. Um, and this strikes us as not only being you know, dangerous from a civil liberties perspective, undermining due process, having privacy concerns, um, but really fundamentally uh, um, 
uh, eroding the very rationale for why there is an administrative state and exposing this administrative state to potential attack by those many, many detractors that say, this is not how things ought to be. This is not how government ought to work. Um, but at the same time, uh, you know, we, we thought to ourselves, we don't wanna deny the government <laughs> the tools of the 21st century. We don't, the solution is not to say, I'm sorry, government, you just can't use technology. Um, and it's frankly not hard to see the way in which the government, um, you know, lags behind other sectors when it comes to technology. Like I can like pay for coffee with my face, <laughs> you know, but if I go to a DMV, I have to bring a cash cashier's check. I mean, um, and, and then if you think about the, the, the software that they're running, the, da you know, the databases. Um, I, I can't believe someone told me that the FBI um, like replaced its, its software like something like 17 years ago and it took like two years to do. I mean, it's just that they're, they're just not using contemporary affordances um, the way that, uh, that many other sectors are. Um, and so, you know, building off of a, just a couple of lines in our, our previous piece, I, I wrote a piece on my own for Duke Law Journal for a symposium that Mason Marks organized. Um, and that's the, that's the work I'm presenting to you today. And this work kind of wants to take seriously um, John McGinnis, the constitutional scholar's question in his 2013 book, Accelerating Democracy, which is how long should we tolerate a government that refuses to take advantage of contemporary affordances? You know, is it okay for us to just let the government, um, you know, uh, use these sort of antiquated systems and not avail itself of, um, of, of the contemporary affordances available to other sectors? Is that a tolerable, a tolerable situation? Um, and one such affordance uh, is modeling. You know, modeling the world, modeling physical phenomena, modeling systems, using computational systems in order to replicate some aspect of uh, a phenomenon. And the government does use modeling, of course, um, in a few important ways. And my favorite example of this is the weather, the weather. So the government spends a lot of resources modeling the weather. Um, and what I like about this example is that it's, it's getting better every year. Like it's objectively getting better. Weather models are objectively getting better year after year. The government is getting better at modeling the weather all the time. And there was a big sea change, a big leap in the capacity of the government to model the weather um, in the 1970s with the rise of supercomputing. And now they're thinking about introducing machine learning kind of hesitantly. But anyway, the point of the matter is they're getting better and better at it, objectively speaking. And they set a standard for excellence. And the second thing I like about the example is it's deeply consequential. Lots and lots of people, lots and lots of activities rely upon government um, modeling of weather. You know, navigation, farming, um, military, I mean, you, you name it, they're using, they're using these things. Um, and I think it's attractive to think that we could be using modeling, these powerful tools of modeling um, in, in, a, in a lot more contexts, including even contexts where it's not about wind and precipitation and temperature, but it's actually human behavior at issue, which is sometimes um, discussed in the literature as agent-based modeling. The idea being that you're modeling the behaviors of actual agents rather than um, uh, uh, physical properties that obey um, uh, uh, physics alone. Um, we obey physics too, but you, you get what I mean. Um, and so like, for example, Los Angeles uses these, these complex models to time traffic lights. Um, and so you think about all those urban designers who apparently grew up playing SimCity, that, <laughs> remember that great game, it became The Sims. It's like a game where you get to, get to change the parameters of a city and watch it grow or, or, or wither or, or change. Um, all those people that, that urban planners who grew up playing SimCity could use modeling, for example, um, modeling the impacts on their city of a soda tax before implementing it or something like that. Um, 
but it's important not to get carried away. So Charles Lindblom, I mentioned at the outset, a famous political economist, he wrote The Science of Muddling Through 60 years ago now. But his point remains a forceful one, which is that policymakers simply don't have the information and wherewithal in order to address societal problems at the root, centrally at the root, like, you know, by just sort of looking holistically and addressing the problem, but rather they have to proceed according to what he calls the branch method, um, which is that you intervene more or less, um, I don't want to use a pejorative term, but you, you, you intervene without full information. You intervene kind of on, 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 on with, you know, with, with hope and, and, and so on, that it'll, that it'll work. Um, and then inevitably you end up having to correct unintended consequences or address the problem again if it didn't work. Um, so it's this idea that you muddle through, you muddle through by, um, by, uh, by just intervening in different ways and then hoping for the, for the best. Um, we are very, very far from, you know, Plato's utopia um, with its philosopher kings. That's not what we're actually working with. Um, but one place where modeling, I think, could really make a difference in governance today, and a place that I, I, I put a lot of emphasis on in the, in the work, um, is places where agencies are already required to do cost-benefit analysis, or impact analysis. So the idea is the government will have to figure out what is, the, what is the potential impact of this intervention on the environment, on small businesses, on privacy, right? People have argued that we should do algorithmic impact assessments. Um, and then also uh, just a straightforward you know, cost benefit analysis. How do, we, how do we figure out what this will cost both the government, but also society versus the benefit that it will bring. Um, and I gotta tell you that right now, those things are basic. They are basic, right? So, I mean, it is back of the napkin type stuff, all right? I mean, I went looking for like guidance from different kinds of bodies like OMB and so on about how to do cost benefit analysis. And it's laughable. It's like step one, what are the costs? Have you counted all the costs? Have you counted the cost to yourself? Have you counted the cost? To, you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's Dr. Seuss type stuff. And then it's like, compare that to the benefits. Um, and so you're just amazed. I mean, this is like, ex, this is Excel spreadsheets. This is just back of the napkin type stuff. Um, and meanwhile, they're the agencies are required or expected to do this work. Um, and so one place that I, I think would be really helpful and beneficial um, would be to bring much more sophisticated tools to bear on, on, on cost benefit to the extent that it's needed um, and to impact assessment. And indeed we do see this. So we see this in uh, European budgeting uh, context where they use modeling in order to figure out what the budgetary impacts of a, of a law might be. Uh, we see this in the financial sector where um, financial interventions by the government are modeled as against the economy. Um, you know, there, there, is some, there is some really um, interesting potential there in my, in my view. Um, but even as we embrace modeling, if we do, we should be aware of at least two kinds of dangers, two sets of dangers, let me say. And the first set of dangers is just well understood to a community that has now been studying, um, you know, algorithmic governance for years, you know, people like like Jonathan and, and many other people on, on this uh, Zoom. Um, and these are things like privacy and discrimination and automation bias, right? I mean, so if, 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 you, if you're a society that is trying to give each according to their need, you need to know a lot about people. What do they need? <laughs> you know, who are they? What do they need, right? Um, so uh, contrast that to a market mechanism where you just, you know, have let the market distribute goods and services, you know, that kind of thing can be quite data intensive. And of course, models are data hungry, starving. They, they just want to know everything so that, um, so especially one, ones that leverage, you know, sort of larger data sets, those are trained machine learning models. They're, they're really data intensive and that could obviously raise questions like people, 
I mentioned at the outset my being able to open uh, coffee with my face and how the IRS would love to let make you, you know, um, uh, identify yourself with your face. These things are these things are fraught potentially. Um, discrimination, obviously, right? I mean, at this point, you know, even though it's been like, I don't know, gosh, was that mid '90s? It's been 20, 30 years since Helen Nissenbaum and Batia Friedman wrote um, Bias in Computer Systems, and now there's just like a really robust literature around those things. Uh, led uh, by people of color, by, especially by women of color, who have just thoroughly evidenced and theorized the incredible amount of um, discriminatory potential of, of things like algorithms and, and bias in the way that it's no coincidence that the you know, accidents, the mistakes involving um, false arrests that have been documented you know, across the United States due to facial recognition uh, tools no coincidence that that is overwhelmingly black men, right? Um, these systems have bias. Um, and then also there's a brittleness to them. And anybody who, who studies this area closely from a technical perspective is aware of a few examples where either a model trained in one context was then deployed in another and it didn't work because you know they didn't model kangaroos or because you know whatever happens to be, or even a model has been created that seemed to work just fine, but then conditions shifted in some way and the model ceased to work. So you can't use Google Flu Trends anymore to distribute flu resources because it doesn't work the same way, stop working the same way. Um, now, the, the modeling literature, which I'm you know, reasonably aware of, obviously talks a lot about the importance of, of, of dynamically updating models. And so the notion of digital twins, which is a buzzword, it doesn't mean all that much, but the idea of digital twins is that you would not just model the world, but you'd model the world and continuously refine that model on the basis of new live data, right? Um, and so there's ways to mitigate some of these things. There's ways to mitigate the privacy concerns like differential privacy. Ostensibly, there's ways to uh, uh, address discrimination, although being structural, it's quite a challenge. Um, uh, tr better training could help to mitigate automation bias and so on. But anyway, there's this first set of dangers that come with modeling, no doubt. The second set of issues though is maybe more familiar to those people who have been long-standing critics of systems and cost-benefit analysis itself. These are not necessarily unique to modeling per se, but they're the idea that systems analysis and cost-benefit analysis, which grew up in the 60s and 70s and has been sort of you know, taken over many sectors of, of, of governance, honestly, um, the truth of the matter is, is that models have the potential to reify and exacerbate and hide some of the deep, deep problems with cost-benefit analysis and systems analysis. Um, incidentally, for systems analysis, think like RAND, like scenario analysis, you know what I mean? Like looking at complex systems and attempting to sort of, you know, figure out different plausible scenarios in order to, in order to navigate, um, navigate uh, decision-making. So the truth of the matter is, of course, is that models um, are not perfect replicas of the world by any stretch of the imagination. Models systematically include and exclude on the basis of what is legible, what about the world is legible, um, and, uh, and also the normative priors of the model. And so SimCity, I mentioned before, you know, um, launched a generation of urban planners. SimCity and The Sims, some of the most popular games in video game history. They were designed by a person who had been reading Jay Forrester's controversial book, Urban Dynamics. As such, the game embeds a worldview wherein economic activity is the leading indicator of human flourishing and where government intervention tends to undermine progress. So these things are all the more concerning, all the more dangerous for their invisibility. And if you don't understand how the model came to be, 
based on what the what was legible, what could be counted. And this is, of course, again, a very much um, mirrors critiques of cost benefit analysis, which talk about how, how weird it is and how problematic it is to, to pretend that you can quantify these values and compare them to one another. One of the leading scholars who's critical of cost benefit analysis talks about the idea of doing a cost benefit analysis about trying to reduce the amount of sexual assault in prison and how just perverse it is to try to compare the money spent on guards and, 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 and technology and whatever else to the absence of sexual assault as though that could somehow be quantified. It's, it's, it's bizarre, right? Um, and so modeling too picks what else is, is legible in the world um, and is, is relatively selective. And then again, embed certain fundamental assumptions about, about the world that are inherently normative. So think, you know, do, do artifacts have politics? Do models have politics? Um, obviously a reference to Langdon Winner. Um, so my ultimate conclusion, I'm, I'm used to going into a project and saying, I have this strong thesis and here's what it is and I'm gonna defend it because I'm a legally trained you know, scholar and that's kind of a lot of what we do. But with this project, or maybe it's like my gray hairs, um, I, I just, I don't, I ultimately come out thinking that there's just a fundamental tension, that there's, that there's, that, that basically modeling presents a kind of a paradox or a kind of a, puts policymakers in a kind of a bind. Because on the one hand, how can they, policymakers, how can they ignore these powerful affordances that are used whenever anybody wants to build an airplane or, or uh, uh, move into a new market or whatever it is that they're trying to do? How can, I don't know, um, uh, think about the, the, the impacts of a, of a, of a drug. Um, you know, how, how can the government just basically ignore this powerful affordance that could promote human flourishing on the one hand? Right? Um, how could they not improve on this terrible back of the napkin cost benefit analysis or impact analysis when these tools are available to them? Um, on the other, you know, modeling introduces these perils, right? Um, and the thing is, is that government agencies right now are being told that the water is warm, that they need to jump into uh, AI, they need to jump into machine learning, right? And that's true, the water is warm, right? But also, um, you know, there's sharks in it. <laughs> so I think there's a fundamental tension where on the one hand, you know, they, we ought to be expecting our government update its affordances for the contemporary age like other sectors do. And on the other, um, some, of these, some of these problems are gonna be endemic and so they're gonna be really problematic. Um, so that is the project in, uh, uh, in, a, in a nutshell. I am eager to hear your thoughts and your questions. Um, and I'm gonna turn it back over to Jonathan for moderation, if I may. Um, thank you very much for having me. Thanks for joining us, Ryan. And thanks for that thought provoking uh, overview of your thinking. Um, let me kick things off with a question, um, sort of probing at um, exactly what your concern is here. Um, um, right. As, as I understand it from reading the, the, the draft, you're dissatisfied with the, the state of uh, AI adoption and related tool adoption um, in government. Um, what was less clear to me was what exactly was the nature of that dissatisfaction? Was it that current tools um, support human decision making in a very secondary capacity and you'd like to see them move more towards a primary capacity? Is it the application to specific topics? Um, is it the level of sophistication that you find dissatisfying? Um, is it the specific types of models? So you'd like to see agent-based models as opposed to um, other types of uh, AI systems? You know, so what exactly is it that's, that, that puts you off about where we are today and what the trajectory is? Well, you know, what, what puts me off is the disconnect between the expectations that we have of government that decisions will be well-informed and based on the best methods and data 
um, and the actual reality. And that's why I keep gravitating towards places in the law where there is a literal requirement by Congress that they do some kind of impact analysis or else there is an expectation by OMB, by the, by the president in essence, that, um, that they do a cost benefit analysis. Um, and so the thing that, that bothers me is there's an obligation, they have to do something. There are tools available to do it better uh, and they're not leveraging them, you know? And so like w one of the really cool things has been in, in the last few years, we've gotten a heck of a lot more information about how the government is using AI and automation. There is a big study out of Stanford and NYU um, that canvasses that literature. There was a separate study that, that um, Carrie Kalianese uh, and his co-author did at Penn that does some of that. But also there's been like all this litigation where people have challenged um, uh, the crappy effects of, of, of especially state automation systems. And so we get a, we really get a good picture about how this stuff's being used. And what I say in the paper and I'll say today is that by and large, my impression is that the government is not modeling through from the perspective of using these ways of, of analyzing the world by replicating it in part, that rather what they're doing is they're kind of muddling through with like trying to muddle through with greater efficiency, you know? Um, and so I'm just, I'm disappointed that, I'm disappointed that the government, um, you know, continues, continues to use outdated and never very rigorous uh, methods to do things that it's obligated to, obligated to do, if that makes sense, right? But at the same time, I'm, I'm, I'm aware and, and, and quite maybe over aware of, of all the problems that it, I mean, we didn't, one thing I didn't even talk about is the way it feels to have a government that tries to like exquisitely calibrate your world for you using algorithms. I mean, it's the, it's the stuff of, uh, of science fiction. Um, but anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm worried in the, sh in the short term about, about, some of these, about some of these problems. I don't know how responsive that is, Jonathan. It's, it's more like they're being told they have to do certain actions for which there are tools. It's like saying, you know, um, you're obligated to keep your, your lawn cut. You know what I mean? And, and so, okay, well, then I'll be out there with my scissors day after day when there's a lawnmower, right? It's, it's that kind of thing that's troubling me. Uh, that's very helpful. Um, folks, if you have questions, please go ahead and uh, raise your hand. Uh, I'll be uh, sort of maintaining a queue. Uh, and uh, first off, our fearless leader, Matt. Hey, Matt. Thank you, Ryan. That was very fascinating. I wanted to ask a little bit more about kind of one of your idea that there are these better techniques available that will make a big difference? Because for certain kinds of cost benefit calculations, it's not clear to me that certain kinds of things are obviously better than the basic procedure that you're describing. Um, and so like to contrast to the weather, which I think is a good example, the weather is one system that they're able to continuously study over long periods of time every single policy change would require its own very complicated system. It might not be feasible to really do this kind of complexity for lots and lots of different decisions. So I'm wondering if you could talk more about, you know, is, is the government really just using scissors when a lawnmower is available? I don't know. I, I, I honestly don't know, right? So, I, you know, the other night um, we watched one of my favorite sort of recent movies um, in the last whatever number of years, which is um, Moneyball, which obviously is, um, is uh, based on a book. Um, and what struck me was how recent <laughs> it was that the A's and later the Red Sox adopted the techniques um, of, uh, of, of econometrics and applied them, right? And today, it's not like it's all statistics and nothing else, but every single team has a statistician or more. Every single team is using modeling, frankly, to show what the impact of the introduction of a new player would be, right? Um, could I have said that that would be um, uh, materially better than what was happening before? Uh, no, and neither could Billy Bean. And it was a huge, huge risk. And he was losing for a while until he went on a 20 game streak. So Matt, I don't know. 
I mean, I don't know whether, you know, but the, the truth of the matter is, is that do we just leave it on the table because we don't know, right? No, we, we go and we experiment. We see whether something better could be done, knowing full well that when McDonald's is making a decision about, you know, what to change in its menu or to go into a different market, guess what? They're using these kinds of tools. Now, are they, would they be better off just sitting around in a room and, and doing it on the back of a napkin or using an Excel spreadsheet that hasn't been updated in 15 years? Maybe, but that's not what they're doing. You know what I mean? And so I, I'm saying that we owe it, society, society like should expect the government to be looking at these tools to see whether they do improve. Does that make sense, Matt? I'm not, I'm not trying to make a claim that I know it will. Yeah, it makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. Plus, I got to tell a Moneyball story. Um, <laughs> and Brad Pitt, that guy is a really good actor and also very handsome. Okay, sorry. Um, if we're going to get into uh, failures of government IT stories, I'm also happy to regale. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I see Janet. Thanks, Brian. Mm -hmm. Thanks for this really interesting talk. Hi, everyone. Um, I want to jump off of two concepts that you mentioned or that you keep coming back to. One is legibility and the other is efficiency. And I want to give a little more context to them because I think they flesh out where some of the actual concerns lie, which are not in whether or not the government should or should not be using tools, but in which issues are suffusing the government's interest in using such tools or a push towards doing them to begin with. So one is the question of legibility, which I'm sure you know is a, is a very important concept, a concept of someone like um, Scott, right, in seeing like a state, where the point is, is that you take populations and make them legible. And there's a great Kai paper that came out last year by Phoebe Singers um, and, a, and a student on legibility and racialized dispossession of land and digital ar agriculture that looks at how the very act of making agricultural land legible to systems, and these are like Arduino and Raspberry Pi based systems that the farmers are working with themselves, is actually a process of dispossession. And it sort of continues this notion of legibility as used from the capital S state, seeing like a state down into these little devices. So the problem is not just that algorithms are biased or just that their data sets are biased. It has to do with the very process of making uh, land or people legible to a state infrastructure to, or to a computational infrastructure. And the second thing is that you throw this notion of like, it should be more efficient. They should be doing things efficiently. In the work that I'm doing with Dana Boyd, we've been really interested in how and why efficiency rhetorics entered into the public sector, especially in the 1980s with the rise of the Reagan administration, um, under a kind of pressure towards austerity and how they've come to kind of an, a frenetic apotheosis right now. Like I study NASA, she's been embedded at the census and like, it's all about efficiency. It doesn't seem to be about efficiency in the private sector where like you can get on a plane and go to a Google meeting in like two seconds, but any way that you can save money, save time, in these public sector spaces seems to be important. And I wonder if those two elements aren't pushing you towards an assumption that the government should be using certain kinds of tools to fulfill what seem to be its governmental responsibilities, when actually there might be solutions where, because those are part of the problem, the government might have an opportunity to, to invent some different kinds of tools that move away from those kinds of, like the persistent issues that we see in those environments. And maybe to flip what Matt said on its head, like he said, maybe, you know, they're using scissors and they should use a lawnmower. Like maybe they want a lawnmower, but they should really be using scissors. Maybe something like local tech is actually more, and, and localization is actually more valuable to combat some of the problems we see with efficiency rhetorics and with legibilities that enter into civic tech. So I just throw that out there as a provocation, just because it sounds like this is uh, a project where you want some intellectual foment around it. And I wanted to see where you're at and you're thinking in those in those topics and where they're pushing you. Janet, that's terrific. I mean, I have a lot to say about this and I'll try not to go on and on and on. So, um, so Seeing Like a State. So that's a book that has been really influential to me. I, I reference it in the paper. I, well, hold on a second. I have it right here. Um, it's a terrific book for anybody. I recommend that you, uh, that you check it out. Um, you know, without even getting into computation, without even getting into, you know, comp computation at all, the, the, the mere fact that the state tries to intervene by rendering something as complex and ineffable as a, as a society and an, and, an, and an environmental ecosystem legible by particular metrics is deeply, deeply problematic. I have a white paper that we're writing at the Tech Policy Lab 
And so I really need to check out that Kai paper and maybe you could even help me find it a, a, a bit. Um, but um, it's about the way in which um, precision agriculture has um, uh, reshaped the farm um, and how government is over investing uh, in certain kinds of um, tech, techno technological modalities that actually are about efficiency. Um, and are, they're, really a, they're really privileging volume, right? Over resilience, over nutrition. Um, and that there are all these opportunities for so-called civic agricultural technologies that um, focus more on things like storage and transportation and local networks and things like that. So the lab has a final draft of that of that um, uh, of that paper, and I can't I can't wait to circulate it because you know farm policy is tech policy these days, and a lot of it has to do with legibility. So I, I agree with you violently and uh, and I can't wait to share this some of this work product that, that I'm working on and with my colleagues um, in other units uh, in other disciplines about efficiency I don't know that I completely agree with you um, so efficiency is an important value in any number of legal domains take for example procedure civil or criminal procedure efficiency is a norm that is embedded throughout procedure and procedural law is very much uh, attendant to efficiency and yes it can be fetishized it can be over you know um, uh, it can be fetishized it can be over exam over exam over over privileged um, that said efficiency is important in a world of finite resources right you could have a perfect trial for a hundred people a year but that would not be justice because hundreds of thousands of people would never be able to get in and in, in see their day in court, right? You, need, you know, efficiency is necessary in a world of finite resources. Similarly, there could be great government largesse. And believe me, I, be, I wish there were much, much more um, money available to the government, but at some point, where does that money come from? It is, it is of course, extracted from the citizenry. The government doesn't have its own way of, of making money. Um, and hence efficiency has to be important, right? Because, I mean, I think we're spending money in the wrong places. I think we are absolutely, um, what is the saying? You know, uh, penny wise, pound foolish. I mean, there's so much more should be, we should be investing up front, for example, with wraparound services in order to head off all of these horrible and ultimately extremely expensive outcomes that come from poverty. Like, believe me, I'm on the same program, but we cannot jettison, in my opinion, the importance of, of, of efficiency, right, overall. Nor do I take you or Dana or anybody to be saying that precisely, but I do wanna say that I think um, efficiency continues to be a value. But the normative baseline for this paper has largely been about the government's own stated goals. We're trying to do X. And I'm saying, okay, we're well, trying to do X. Have you seen these tools over here that help you do X? And you're saying, is X the right thing to do? Maybe it's Y, and I, I agree with you. I, I don't know what to say, I agree with you. Well, thank you both. Uh, next up was uh, Mihir. Hey, Ryan. Uh, I, I was thinking about sort of, uh, some concrete examples of, of the kinds of things where this would happen, right? So, uh, are you so one way of, of your criticism of the current state of being is that let's say when the SEC is looking for insider trading, it's not using the latest algorithmic model to find it, and and so therefore. Uh, you know, it's got to update its processes to discover nefarious activity. Another kind of government activity would be that the government is engaged in risk predictions for determining whether somebody should get bail or not. Um, and you are saying in those situations, right, applying a model to find the solution would not would not be the right fit. So I'm wondering, as you, as you sort of laying that out, is there a way to decide what kinds of things deserve a model answer and what kinds of things don't deserve a model answer? What are your thoughts on sort of how how people might be able to tax, you know, create a taxonomy of when you might think of when to apply a model solution? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, in fact, uh, I was just on a, uh, in, a in this symposium with with uh, with with Kerry Kalyanese, who I mentioned before, and he, he's coming up with, a, he and his student, um, Allison, 
I, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on, on her name, um, quite a good paper. Um, and they're, they're coming up with, a, with just that, you know, sort of a rubric under what conditions might it be appropriate to apply, you know, um, algorithms is, is their way of thinking. Um, I'm not. I'm not so sure. I mean, so first of all, when when the when the ACUS report, this is the Stanford um, and NYU report with ACUS, which is an, an agency that helps with, sorry, Janet, uh, efficiency of uh, of that ad, ad, administrative state. Um, when they did their survey um, here, they actually found that that's precisely the way that it was that machine learning was being applied was to try to find uh, enforcement opportunities, um, and so the idea was to like look at insider trading, look at tax fraud, you know, like, like just put, like, you know, because obviously that's, we know that's how machine le learning works. Like you train it up on a data state, set, you hold data back or you present it with a new case and in the inference stage is telling you whether it thinks this fraud or not. Um, and, you know, with all the usual caveats around, is it really working? Does it have a disparate impact on people, you know, et cetera? Um, is it invasive uh, from a privacy perspective? Um, yeah, I mean, I support you know that kind of thinking um, of, of of being of being more targeted in terms of enforcement. Um, the, what I'm interested in with modeling is more if you're purporting to make a claim about how an intervention will affect the world, which is Charles Lindblom's question. You know what I mean? And Hayek's question. And you know, the, but the idea is like if you're if you're purporting to make a claim about how will making this change to the law affect the world? How will, how will changing this traffic, how will the introduction of a bike lane and blah, 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 you know, boulevard affect traffic? If you're trying to make a claim about the world um, and, you're, and you're not availing yourself of, of, of modeling, right? It is, is are, are you doing a disservice, especially where the law requires you to do a version of modeling, not computational modeling, but a version of prediction. Um, so uh, I really, I really haven't, I really haven't thought hard about, you know, I think it's a huge question of, you know, where is it appropriate for the government to use computation and where not, you know, but it's an old question too. I mean, my when I was at um, I was at Dartmouth College for undergraduate. I was a philosophy major. One of my favorite professors was a guy I didn't even know how important this guy was, but Jim Moore who wrote, you know, are there decisions that computers should not make in like, what did he even write that in the 60s maybe? Um, and the idea was to think through from an ethical standpoint, what kinds of, what kinds of compute, what kind of systems, you know, what kind of decisions do we really want computers to be making even if they're sort of quote unquote better or more efficient or whatever to add something. Um, and his conclusion there was high level, but it was sort of like, we want to use computing to the, maximum we can in order to carry out human judgment about values, but we don't want those computing systems to be the sources themselves of values. Um, and that was, I think, wise thinking, obviously, at a very high level, but I haven't done that exercise here. And I think it would be a super useful project, frankly, for a sophisticated scholar or team of scholars to, to try to come up with a heuristic here, like a, a, a real um, guiding principle. And I think that Kalyanese and his co-author do a bit of that. Um, I don't know how operationalizable their rubric is any more than, than Professor Moore's, uh, than Jim's you know, rubric, um, but it seems like a very worthy thing. Um, for my purposes, let me just restate, for my purposes, I'm really looking at something pretty narrow, which is, Hey, the government is supposed to tell you how something's going to impact the world, and they don't use modeling. What's up with that, right? <laughs> it's kind of my lens, and I it may not be it may not be thoroughly satisfying, but that's where I'm at. Thanks. Thanks, um, uh, Ido. You're next. Thanks, Jonathan. Thank you, Ryan, for a great presentation. Uh, I'm intrigued by your reference to Charles Limblum uh, because. One of the things that Limblom says uh, about banded rationality of policymakers is that it leads to incremental policymaking, right? So policy change is happening in really, really small steps because our policymakers' rationality is kind of bounded uh, because of limitations. And, and I'm wondering maybe one of the implications 
uh, of, of using those models by the government agencies, but also by, po but also by policymakers, would be to, to enable us to diverge from this incremental policymaking path and maybe kind of ease the institu institutional friction that we see in the policymaking process. And I'm wondering if, if, if you're making that link, if you think it's, it's a feasible link to make at all, uh, understanding these models in the government going forward? Yeah, so, you know, this is a, this is a, uh, uh, the, 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 the paper focuses on a couple of narrow things, like I mentioned about, about impact assessment and cost benefit. Um, but I, I do sort of open the paper with just reminding the reader that, that throughout history, people have dreamed of, of these enlightened, fully informed you know, decision makers who are capable of addressing things holistically, right? And so we think about, for example, you know, I mentioned um, Callipolis, you know, this is, this is the, the, the Plato's um, uh, utopia within the philosopher kings, uh, but also like in, in jurisprudence, you have uh, uh, Dworkin's Hercules, who is perfectly uh, able to have in mind like all prior precedent and then come up with a um, sort of unifying political moral theory and then, and, and then come out with exactly the right answer somehow to a legal question. You know, um, there's an element of that in Rawls, there's elements of, of that in a lot of places. Um, you know, I, you know be, wouldn't, that be, wouldn't it be lovely to, to um, quote my fair lady? Um, but th the truth of the matter is, is that no, no person or a group of people have that ability. However, you know, if the government over time were to become more and more confident and comfortable with modeling, um, one could imagine slowly moving away from the so-called branch method of iterative intervention and, and getting more holistic and being able to model with not perfect confidence, but reasonable confidence, how a multi-pronged intervention would affect the world, right? And so, you know, today, um, it's, it, so today it's well understood in, um, in, in anti-poverty, in, um, in addressing, you know, the undomiciled housing first, right? You need, to, you need to stabilize folks, give them housing, don't ask them for anything, let them get, let them be under a shelter and, 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 and be able to wake up at the right time and these kinds of things, and then layer in, you know, services, other, other kinds of services, whether it be they mental health or addiction or whatever it is that that, that population might need, um, and then build up to a point. So that, that idea of housing first um, just turns out to work better. But gosh, did it take decades of rather brutal experimentation and, and, and such a massive failure um, for us to get to that point, right? And even today, lots of places don't adopt it. Right? No, it's in, no, it's it's evidence based. So you know, if there were if there were a way that we could model how multiple different so my, uh, um, it, 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 because there's a little time, I'm making my answers longer than I might otherwise. But let me just digress for just a moment. My colleagues at the Center for an Informed Public. I'm the PI of this big center around misinformation and disinformation, which is interdisciplinary in nature. Um, and uh, my colleagues have this paper where they modeled viral misinformation spread on Twitter um, using you know, massive amounts of, of, of Twitter data. One of our postdocs, um, Joe Buck Coleman, comes from <laughs> computational biology and he used to, his thesis was, was about modeling fish, complex fish behavior you know, like schooling behavior and fish behavior. And he's applying those methods to the spread of misinformation and disinformation online. I just love my job. Um, anyway, so what they did was they modeled, how do we, how would we interrupt that spread of misinformation, you know, all, all, over, all over Twitter? And they tried different kinds of interventions. They modeled different kinds of interventions to see if they might work. So for example, warning people, have you read this article or, uh, you know, taking down certain kinds of, 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 of perpetrators who are, who are egregious and whatever. They modeled a bunch of different things. And what they found through that modeling was that any one of the interventions that Twitter might do on its own had almost had very little effect. And two had 
pretty little effect. But gosh, if you did three or four, all of a sudden, right, you, you, you severely curtail, cur curtail the amount of misinformation and disinformation online. And hence, Twitter could operationalize that knowledge by saying, okay, thank you for modeling this. Will you all four of these at once? And we'll see how, how that plant pans out rather than I'm gonna try this one and it didn't work. And I'm gonna try this one and it didn't work. And meanwhile, there's a bunch of bad information floating around about COVID and people are literally dying. You know what I mean? And so that, that's, the, that's the idea, right? The idea is that like, is that you could, you could just slowly and in a really humble way, move away from the idea of, I don't know, let's, let's tax soda. What the hell, I, I don't know. I mean, be, you know what I mean? It's just like, you know, what, and try to figure out like some sense of what might work um, and, and, not, and not just treat everybody all the time as guinea pigs, which is a very interesting, again, 60 years, Charles Lindblom's like, that, it is one of the most cited papers in public policy in history. It, it has orders of magnitude more citations and, and it continues to be, I look, it continues to be cited in policy circles to this day in law review articles and in, 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 in political science, an incredibly influential um, uh, paper. Um, and uh, are we destined as humans for all time? To muddle through, right? Um, but I, but I would be the first to acknowledge that we're not, we're not there yet. We're not really able to do that yet. That was long-winded. You know, thank you for your great question. Uh, so Ryan, if I could riff some on uh, your observations in response to the the, the past several questions, um, and uh, to some extent ask you follow-up questions. Um, uh, um, uh, so uh, th three observations come to mind. The first is, um, I think a challenge for this project of yours is articulating what exactly is different between modeling as you conceive of it and other applications of AIML or to use an even more buzzy phrase, big data, um, right? You, you have something particular in mind um, and a couple of delineations that come to mind for me uh, are, Maybe what you're getting at is the barriers to policy advancements, so your example from homelessness policy, um, right? That the problem is we're not trying enough directions, we're not identifying promising leads, we're not iterating on those leads fast enough, and modeling through more sophisticated computational methods maybe could address that. And um, may maybe that's sort of one path. Uh, the response I would offer to that is that in many areas of policy, I'm not sure the challenge is the actual computational analysis. It's the um, designing the experiment and conducting the experiment and carrying out the data collection, right? Like what, what makes housing policy so difficult is it takes a really long time to build stuff. Um, uh, 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 that isn't to say, you know, analyzing data isn't hard too, but you just have that, that built-in lag time and complexity. Another possible delineation that came to mind for me with uh, your comments was maybe uh, computational modeling allows us to capture complex interrelated factors in ways you couldn't before. So your Twitter misinformation example, where you could sort of build out networks and try to puzzle through the effects of um, particular changes you might make on those networks. Um, and the uh, sort of response I would offer there is, um, is the hard part the modeling in the sense of sort of applying the computational method to the network you've built, or is it coming up with the, here's what the interventions might look like, and then a bunch of assumptions about what the effects of those interventions might be? Um, and uh, the answer to both of those observations, I think, by the way, is like, it's complicated and it's some mix of all of the above. But I think in trying to go in this direction, it's important to sort of tease out Again, what's different from AIML in general? And then what specifically can you solve through computational modeling and what parts of those hard problems are hard for other reasons? So my first observation. Uh, my second is that um, there are uses of modeling to varying degrees of sophistication in government, as you note in, in the piece. Um, um, sometimes I think they can be more sophisticated than they might seem, right? So like there, there are like, non-trivial regression models that show up in uh, government modeling. And that is a type of AIML, right? Regression methods show up in AIML. 
they tend not to be like really fancy, sophisticated, you know, deep learning models or anything, but they appear in government. Um, and so sort of thinking through what the different, like what the delta is between the kinds of models we have today and what models you might get, I think is valuable. Last, I just wanted to offer uh, an observation from my own government experience, um, which is um, the re one of the reasons why we see adoption and enforcement um, um, contexts, something that you know, I worked on firsthand, is there, there's just an entrepreneurship around uh, regulatory enforcement and, and law enforcement in general, that's a little different from other government functions, right? It's, you know, the notion of using new investigative techniques as they become available as part of the job. Um, and there's sort of an in-house capacity to, to come up with new techniques or just try new techniques. Um, again, experimentation is part of the gig. And, um, um, and so, you know, I think there's maybe something to explore there about like the, there might be something recalcitrant about government functions related to the kinds of predictive decision making you have in mind that is different from other government functions and that is something that merits analysis and targeting for intervention anyway i appreciate it. i just threw out a, a bunch but sort of collecting thoughts as you were reacting to prior questions no jonathan that's that's super helpful, and and uh, you know I, I I certainly can't respond at length to all the things you said. I mean, <clears throat> the the first question of like sort of what makes hard problems hard, right? Um, I, I just want to reflect back that I I agree. I mean, I think a lot of times, um, you know, we we have gotten so used to the idea, like so. Okay, there's like a debate right now about what. Um, open AI or DeepMind should take on next. You know what I mean? Having beat Go and having beat chess and having beat, you know, this and that, right? Um, and I'm agitating for those shops, those big AI places to take on Magic the Gathering, okay? Where you have tens of thousands of cards and you assemble a 60 card deck with like a whole strategy in mind for it. And you have to understand like, what is the other person gonna be doing? I need removal, but I also need this, you know, that kind of thing. Um, it's just such a hard problem. And, you know, it, 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 unlike Go or, 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 or chess or even, you know, Dota, you know, like even like a first person shooter, um, it is completely non-trivial in order to frame the question for magic in such a way that a system could start to generate competitive decks and then play them um, in an environment, right? You know, and I think that I think that um, it's easy for the public, in particular, to extrapolate out that because you can solve one particular kind of problem, that you could solve another one. So, for example, it's a false equivalence to say that just because the city of Los Angeles has, you know, not successfully, but has reduced traffic congestion, con, uh, congestion using traffic modeling, right? Does not mean that they can next apply uh, ML or whatever, you know, so, you know, some kind of similar analysis to, um, you know, to, to, to blight or to trash collection, anything else, right? I mean, each problem needs to be uh, teed up in a particular way. And that's something that I think also the AI for good community needs to understand very, very well, which is people like Mill and Tambe, when they go in and design algorithms and, and machine learning models in order to help poachers in Central Africa or to help disseminate uh, AIDS information in, in, in LA, and Millen doesn't just do that on his own. He goes and he partners with people who understand that context very well. So in LA, he partners with Eric Sears, uh, Eric Sears, um, Eric Rice rather, not the great Eric Sears at MacArthur, but um, uh, Eric Rice, who is a social work um, uh, professor who studies uh, AIDS and, and, and homelessness, right? And so when you deploy these systems, you have to be sensitive to the context in which they arise. And sometimes the hard problems are hard problems for reasons that have nothing to do with, with um, uh, modeling. And other times you might try to like surreptitiously solve those problems in the model and it doesn't even appear like you done so and so that's a big problem about looking objective so you like you you reconcile value tension but behind you know um in a way that's not visible to the to the public and so it might be kind of a way to sort of attempt to solve wicked problems with a with a shortcut 
um, that is then invisible to the to the to the uh, to the public. Um, I know we're out of time, so let me just say your other comments were also well taken, and and I know you have a pretty damn relevant experience yourself in in government, and so um, uh, I'm glad I'm 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 glad to hear your perspective. Um, maybe another time I'll. Uh, share with uh, the CITP community uh, how an IT snafu uh, at uh, FCC led to my office being emptied. Uh, and I showed up to an empty office uh, in uh, the one morning. Um, but for another time, uh, uh, Brian, thank you so much for joining us. It's always a pleasure. Um, uh, very interesting work. Um, and uh, I look forward to what comes next. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much for having me. Great questions, everybody. Thanks for giving me some of your afternoon. Talk soon. Thanks, Jonathan. Take care.